Good morning, everyone. Nice to see so many faces early on a Saturday morning. Uh, my name is Jimmy Jacquard. I'm from Arlo Consulting, and we're doing a <coughs> moderation here today. Um, here's my colleague, Christian Cloutier. Uh, there's two of us today, because these uh, communications um, sessions have tended to be feisty in the past, so there's two of us. Um, Christian is a jiu-jitsu expert, and I'm originally from Nova Scotia, so <laughs> <laughs> we should be okay. Um, welcome, communications infrastructure, great topic. Uh, our panel today, Jean-François Jean Dumoulin on the right, Adam Pfizer, Juan Aspinu, and Daniel Rubenstein will be speaking with us today. I'd like to open up, I guess, just to set the stage, a little story, I'm a storyteller from Nova Scotia, just about how important communications are in the north. Um, I moved up north in 1997 in a small community north of Baffin called Pond Inlet, and I had a student, this was in grade six, and I remember sharing a picture, I remember vividly, sharing a picture of me as a young kid in Nova Scotia, and there were all kinds of trees, and it was in the spring, and the trees were, the leaves were hanging in the branches, and he said, oh my, that must have been so scary. And I didn't know what he meant. And what he meant was like, there were trees like engulfing me. And he had never seen a tree, just like I had never seen an iceberg. Um, and I remember that's the feeling I had when I first saw an iceberg. Three football fields in length and twice the height of this convention center. Um, through communications, I've left Pond Inlet in 2002 and I rarely go back, but I'm still really good friends with that student of mine. And now, through communications, it's important for business, for life, for learning, but even more so, I, th I think, um, to share pictures of trees and icebergs and to keep in touch with people. That's one thing. So that's my heartwarming story for the morning. <laughs> and I'm going to hand over the mic to Christian. But before I do that, I'd like to remind you to please um, turn off your mobile devices in case they ring. I've had that happen to me before. There you go. So our first speaker today is uh, Monsieur Jean-François Dumoulin. He is the Senior Coordinator of Programs and Partnerships for the Tamani Internet Section of the Cadvic Regional Government. Jean-François has been with the KRG since 2004, where he's held several positions in in the administration department, including assistant director of the information technology section and assistant director of the Tamani internet section. His current priority is to find a long-term solution to the broadband tele telecommunication challenges facing Nunavik. Thank you for that uh, kind of introduction. I, thank you, I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience. Nice to see everybody uh, come out on a Saturday morning. Um, I notice uh, this, this year the uh, the panel is more focused on uh, the smaller communities and the regional organizations than, uh, than last year and uh, as a result I'm glad to see that the Department of Defense didn't have to send out the Army this time. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, connecting Nunavik. Um, the Academic Regional Government has been providing internet services directly to the population for about uh, 10 years. And uh, we have, in the last several years, um, undergone several studies to, or undertaken several studies to uh, address the telecommunications need of the region. So just to put you in context, I'm sure you've seen this slide many times uh, in other presentations uh, for other topics. Uh, Nunavik covers the top third geographically of northern Quebec. Uh, we have numerous uh, challenges that affect all sectors of activity. Um, and telecommunications is no exception. So it's a vast Arctic territory. It's roughly the size of uh, France, about 500,000 square kilometers. Uh, it's a remote fly-in only communities uh, with very high cost of living, uh, Arctic geography, Arctic weather, which is very hard on communications infrastructure, um, high cost of transportation, uh, and uh, high staff turnover for a variety of reasons. So all of that makes operating a network uh, much, much more expensive than uh, what you would normally see e even in a rural setting, uh, let alone an urban setting. So uh, the current situation uh, in Nunavik uh, is that all telecommunications are done over satellite 
and this is, I guess, if I could call it legacy satellite, it's the same basic technology that's been used for at least uh, 10 years. Um, uh, right now, uh, thanks to the Broadband Canada program, we're able to deliver up to 1.5 megabits uh, in the homes and uh, 3 megabits to businesses. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about uh, telephony. There's uh, a local incumbent there providing uh, telephone service. Uh, so we're, we're largely focused uh, in our telecommunications discussions on uh, future broadband uh, development. So there are numerous challenges, um, but I'm going to talk largely about one challenge, which is the affordability of using uh, the current satellite capacity. Um, and this, is, this will give you an idea of the scope of the problem. So uh, I've seen many figures for how much you pay per megabit on satellite, and that price will vary. It could be more, it could be less. Uh, I use a figure of $3,000 for a bi-directional megabit. Uh, I've seen figures as high as $10,000. I've seen figures as low as $1,500. It doesn't matter whether it's 2,000 times higher than the south or 1,000 times higher than the south. It's exorbitant and it, it's a model that is clearly broken. We cannot continue to offer services to the population at the same level as what is happening in large urban centers with this level of disparity. So that is a huge challenge. There are, there are other challenges. Um, all of them are, are uh, also uh, barriers to providing broadband services uh, in the home. Um, those challenges could range from uh, um, penetration rates, cost, uh, cultural issues, uh, linguistic issues in a largely uh, Inuktitut speaking region. Um, our feeling is that a lot of these issues are uh, addressable. Um, they are big challenges, but we can address them uh, with local organizations working in, in, in collaboration with some governmental organizations. But this one is really sort of the mountain that we need to scale. It's, it's, it's quite insurmountable and we can't uh, solve this one on our own. So uh, last year, the Academic Regional Government um, did a study to, uh, to look at what would it take to um, build a network that would meet Nunavik's long-term needs. Now, it's very difficult to undertake this sort of study because we're talking about what is invariably going to be a moving target. Um, to give you an example, when we started building this network in 2004, um, YouTube had not launched, uh, nobody was using Skype video yet, there was no Facebook, there was no Twitter, there was, certainly was no Netflix, and um, the overriding concern for us was how we were going to get enough capacity so that people could um, use email attachments. Um, so here we are, fast forward 10 years later, with everybody trying to use uh, broadband to watch television at home. So. In, in, in 10 short years, that landscape has changed enormously. And we know this poses a huge challenge for us in terms of projecting out another 10 years because we don't know what the next five years even is going to hold for us. So we set some parameters um, based on, uh, partly based on the CRTC objective of, of bringing five megabits to the home by 2015, but we also looked at our path, past growth so from 2004 to 2014, we know we increased our network 30-fold, so we thought it was a fair assumption that we would need to increase it another 30-fold by uh, going forward 10 years to, um, to meet the needs. So, so with a variety of techniques that we used, we came out to some targets that we wanted to meet, which would be to be able to provide up to 2.5 gigabits for the entire region by 2016 and um, 7.5 by 2021. Um, just to give you an idea, that's uh, right now we have one tenth of 2.5 gigabits for the entire region. So the uh, the study looked. Uh, we tried to take a technology neutral point of view, um, and we really focused on how we would meet those objectives. And we identified three potential technologies that could be used to build a network around uh, Nunavik to connect all 13 communities. 
and uh, we came up with three potential viable solutions, one of which was maybe less suitable than the other two. Um, so uh, undersea fiber optic, uh, there's been a lot of talk about that lately. Uh, so we looked at that. There's no technological impediment to doing it that we found. Uh, the issue really is price. Uh, the capital cost of doing that is quite high. It's $158 million for a construction project. And the operating cost would also be um, potentially significant, although that $6 million is the worst case scenario, per, $6 million per year is the worst case scenario based on uh, a very expensive interconnect with a partner. If we can get a less expensive interconnect with a partner, then that price could go down. So that these are all very much worst case scenario prices. They could be much lower than that, but we don't feel that they're going to be any higher than that. So the fiber optic has some advantages. It's got a 20 year des design life or more, uh, potentially up to 30 years for fiber optics. Uh, it has, and it's, it's quite inexpensive to scale. So if we made a mistake with our predictions and we need more bandwidth, it's, it's relatively easy to get more. Uh, the disadvantage is the very high cost and uh, somewhat longer to deploy and there's also some technical risks in terms of uh, ice damage and so forth that need to be considered. But again, these are technical, uh, limita uh, technical factors that can be accounted for. Um, the other suitable option we found was next generation satellite. And so th there's a lot of confusion because we talk about satellite be too, being too expensive and then we talk about potential uh, satellite uh, as a solution. So. So what's the deal? The deal is with next generation satellites, which is a technology that's actually been in use only for the last couple of years, um, the satellite beams are very highly focused. They are much, much broader than the old satellite beams. Uh, and so they're able to carry a lot more capacity. And so the price per megabit is, is, is significantly lower than what we're currently doing with the legacy satellite uh, technology. So um, in this particular scenario, we're looking at capital expenditure of 94 million. That would put three spot beams of 750 megahertz on Nunavik um, <coughs> for a design life of about 15 years. So the advantage to that is the capex is lower than, than a fiber project. Um, the deployment is probably faster in terms of ground infrastructure. There's no impact on the land. There's no construction. Uh, and if there are any issues with ground infrastructure, it's relatively easy to get to because uh, it's all located within the communities. Um, the disadvantage, of course, is you're still um, uh, you're on a somewhat lower design life uh, than fiber. It's still scalable. If you need more capacity, you can always say, well, we'll just build a second project, but then your capital cost will effectively double to double the capacity. So that becomes very expensive if, if the targets were no good. Um, and, uh, and you still have to deal with uh, technological issues like latency that uh, satellite uh, induces on, on, on the network. The last option we looked at was building a ring of microwave towers. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about that. The capital cost is actually lower, but the, the operating cost uh, is higher um, because you have to build towers in areas where there's no power infrastructure, there's no road infrastructure. So you're looking at helicoptering out to 50 tower sites to maintain them. Um, and we had a very hard time building a network above 2.5 gigabits that could run only <coughs> on uh, green energy. And the reason why we run on renewable energy is we didn't think it was uh, feasible in terms of the operating expense to helicopter and diesel on a regular basis to these towers. So, so we could go up to 2.5 gigabits using wind solar batteries with diesel backup, which means we'd have to visit the towers at most once a year. Um, but that doesn't meet our design target of 7.5 gigabits. So it was somewhat less favorable. There's also less appetite from what I've seen talking to people in the region to put 50, uh, 100 meter towers uh, on the land. So. Um, I think the other two solutions seem to be uh, what, uh, what we're favoring. Um, to accompany this uh, feasibility study, we, uh, we also did a socioeconomic study to look at the impact of this. So now the answer to the first question was, well, how much is it going to cost? So now we know how much it's going to cost. The second, uh, the second question is, well, what is it going to bring to the region in terms of both Social, uh, in both economic impact and in terms of social impact. So, um, so we did a socioeconomic study that looked at 
uh, sort of a very acad in very academic terms, the available statistics, and Nunavik is a, is a huge challenge for statistics because it's incorporated in, in other regions of Quebec. So we can't go to StatsCan and just pull out statistics on Nunavik because they're all incorporated with some of the other Abitibi regions, uh, which are socioeconomically are, are vastly different from what uh, we have in our region. So it was, it was quite difficult to, to establish a baseline and, and come up with this analysis. But in, in a best case scenario, based on the statistics we had and based on the hypotheses we had to make to fill in some of the gaps, we're looking at potentially uh, up to an increase of $55 million to the to Nunavik's GDP over an eight year period and potentially uh, $225 million over a 15 year period. So if you put that on a graph, that's what it looks like. Now, our academic study stops at 2023. Um, I sort of played around with the numbers and said, well, what if you extrapolate that to the design life of the network? You know, that slope might go down. It might not go up as fast, but ultimately, no matter how you look at it, uh, it's apparent that the value of the network um, is such that it, it almost makes no sense not to build it. Uh, in terms of the benefits, while there are all sorts of socioeconomic benefits, we've been talking about them for the last 10 years. Uh, participation in the moder modern digital economy by far is, is one of the overriding factors, but we're also talking about improved uh, education, better health, decreased costs and waste time for justice department, um, decreased staff turnover for employers, and uh, increased civic engagement, which we actually have seen on, on the, even on the uh, satellite network right now. Uh, we, we talked a lot, we heard a lot in the news about the Arab Spring and how Facebook was important to that. Well, in Nunavik, uh, in the last three or four years, there have been uh, three elections that have been hotly debated, debated largely on Facebook. So, so the internet is really changing how people communicate and how they get engaged. Uh, and that's something that we really want to see uh, and, and is a very positive impact for the uh, population. So our position basically is that in the 21st century, broadband is an essential necessity. We can't, it's, it's no longer a luxury. I, I don't think anybody is debating that point anymore. And in the, in the context that we are in Nunavik, given such a small market and a high cost, uh, it's not feasible to do it just in the private sector. So the federal and provincial governments have to continue to provide financial assistance as they have in the past for broadband uh, development. However, we're really pushing for a long-term recurring funding model. We've benefited from several ad hoc targeted initiatives. They're finite, they end, they leave us hanging in, with a great deal of uncertainty, wondering if we're gonna have to turn the service off at some point, and that is not a way to, to manage in any way, shape, or form something that is so vital to society. And lastly, uh, our position is that the local organizations are better, best suited to serve local needs. So we understand our people, we know what they need, we know how to, um, we know how to make sure they have the service at a, an affordable cost and in, in an equitable manner. So in conclusion, basically, uh, there's no technological impediment <coughs> to building a network. We demonstrated that it can be done. Uh, a significant investment will be required. Somebody somewhere has to open a checkbook and sign a check. It's the only way this is gonna get done. The private sector is not going to be able to do it themselves. Uh, but in the long run, the socioeconomic study shows that that investment will pay for itself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dulay. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Adam Pfizer. He is a senior research associate uh, for the Conference Board of Canada, Centre for the North. He earned his PhD in the Information Knowledge Media Design Collaborative Program from the University of Toronto. Uh, for the past several years, Adam has been an adjunct instructor with the University of Toronto, a researcher with Aboriginal Affairs in Northern Development Canada, and a postdoctoral fellow at the Ted Rogers School of Information Technology Management at Ryerson University. He authored the Center for the North's Report Tele Telecommunications and Broadband Connectivity, Mapping the Long-Term Options for Canada's North and I am working with the Conference Board of Canada. I think I gave you guys the wrong bio, sorry about that. So in 2014, the immediate concern for Northern stakeholders, both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, 
is to develop critical network transport infrastructure that is reliable, scalable, and supported with lo locally affordable services over the long term. In this presentation, I'll argue that open access networks have a greater role to play in addressing this concern. Now, uh, the Canadian Radio, Television and Telecommunications Commission, our national regulator, also appears to recognize the value of open access network solutions in the North. But I would argue that its efforts have so far been undermined by the adversarial nature of the regulatory system. I believe that at this time, more effective solutions ground open access networks in publicly owned infrastructure. And I'll be discussing an example from Northern Quebec, the EU Communications Network. So our story begins with a statement made by the regulator in its December 2013 decision on Northwest Health's regulatory framework. In this decision, the Commission considers that investing in transport upgrades is an important priority for telecommunications development in the North and that such investment is required for economic development and to meet the growing demands of Northern customers for access to services such as healthcare, education, government programs, and banking. Now, uh, Jean-Francois, and I'm sure Juan and Daniel, um, are gonna adequately cover the potential opportunities and challenges around satellite-dependent networks, particularly in Nunavut and Nunavik. I'm going to try to remain technologically neutral here, as my argument shouldn't depend on technology. What I want to discuss are the organizing principles that currently shape how the northern telecom industry and governments invest in northern backbone, backhaul transport for broadband networks. My position is that investments could be better organized under open access principles. These principles include non-discrimination by access providers, non-competition with local service providers, fair and transparent pricing, and possibly other social policy objectives. But the enforceability of open access network principles depends on who owns and controls core assets. That is, who owns the backbone is critical, even in the case of CRTC interventions. So given that open access networks depend on mutual interest rather than narrow self-interest, they rarely emerge without a policy intervention. But before we get into open access networks, we need to understand high cost serving areas for broadband. Incumbent local exchange carriers, these are Bell Alliance, MTS, SaskTel, Telus, and Northwest Tel, are responsible for delivering basic service objectives throughout their operating regions, including high cost serving areas. But the incumbents have no particular obligation to deliver or support broadband. That said, Northwest Tel was considered to be special due to its market power and the high cost characteristics of its serving area, Yukon, Northwest Territories, Nunavut, and Northern BC. So in 2013, the CRTC decided to regulate Northwest Tel's broadband transport and retail internet services. There are, however, other northern regions that exhibit cost characteristics similar to the territories. There's Nunavut, Iuishchi, Nishnabiaski, Nunatsiavu, and Manitoba, Kuwait, Nooyoku, Makanak. These are also high cost serving areas where incumbent telephone providers can have significant market power, but they don't have a special regulatory framework. So the CRTC has created parallel high cost serving areas for broadband. One is regulated, the rest unregulated. In reviewing Northwest Health's special regulatory framework, the CRTC in 2013-711 decided that it has a role to play in ensuring the incumbent can you, continues to invest in broadband transport and provide transport services at reasonable rates to its competitors with adequate quality of service. By contrast, while deliberating obligations to serve in high cost serving areas outside of Northwest Hills market area, in a previous decision, 2011-291, the CRTC discussed similar transport issues, what it called middle mile challenges, without raising them specifically in its decision. The CRTC had concluded that the deployment of broadband internet access services in rural and remote areas should rely on market forces. And in this case, deployment implied transport issues. In 2013, we saw the CRTC try to enforce open access to Northwest Hills backbone. 
In reviewing Northwest Bell's special regulatory framework, the CRTC, in its December decision, re-examined an earlier decision that it had made previously in February to force the incumbent to offer a wholesale connect service for competitors to access its fiber and microwave transport networks. The earlier decision appeared punitive, considerably punitive, and set pricing conditions that lowballed Northwest Tell's capital costs. This led the ILEC to threaten withholding further investments in fiber upgrades. Fearing a crisis, the December 2013 decision reversed the February decision in favor of a cost-based pricing scheme that is much closer to Northwest Hell's original cost estimates. What remains unclear to me is why the CRTC changed this decision so drastically. Was it wrong in its cost calculations so completely, or does it have no way to actually enforce its decision in this case? Either option doesn't build confidence in the regulator's ability to regulate open access. And I recognize that there are some representatives here from Northwest Hell, so I welcome their perspective on what actually happened in that proceeding. But my argument goes thusly. Northwest Hell's backbone is a privately owned network asset. The regulator is at a disadvantage when it comes to understanding the true state of the incumbent's infrastructure and costs. It relies on an adversarial form of inquiry whereby parties interested in shaping Northwest Tell's services introduce their perspectives of what's real and unreal, fair or unfair. In this adversarial environment, the incumbent is not made to feel like its best interests are being served. Moreover, most of the parties contributing to the inquiry only have access to redacted information about the incumbent and its competitors, as the CRTC seeks to protect the telecom provider's commercial secrets. When the dust settles, the regulator has to try and sort out truth from fiction before making its decision. What causes the regulator to vacillate in its judgment isn't necessarily any one individual or organization's fault. I believe it's a flaw of the regulatory system's adversarial nature, which is a barrier to developing open access networks. Now, the CRTC also learned about open access in EU issue, Northern Quebec. Three delegates from EU Ishii, and Alfred Loon is present uh, today in northern Quebec, took advantage of the CRTC's public review of Northwest Hill to relate their story of open access. The Cree communities of EU Ishii and neighboring Jamesian municipalities had for years appealed to their incumbent, Telebec, or Bell Alliance, for improved telecom services, but to no avail. Knowing a regulatory solution was unavailable, the local and regional governments lobbied their counterparts at provincial and federal levels, and this took place over a considerable number of years, since at least 2003, and Alfred can correct me. With a bit of luck and ingenuity, they discovered Hydro-Quebec's optical ground wire, which had excess transport capacity that could provide a backbone network along the path of electrical transmission lines in the James Bay region. Their incumbent continued to want no part in this venture, despite its potential for improving regional telecommunications. But local, regional, provincial, and federal public stakeholders realized that it was in their best interests to cooperate and co-invest in building out an open access backbone network. Under Cree leadership, the resulting not-for-profit fiber optic backbone is open access in several ways. Partners are not adversaries. They are co-investing in a common solution and can make better informed decisions because they see the books, they see how the operations are running, they have a hand in understanding how the plan is unfolding, and they're contributing to that plan. As customers, service providers share the cost and benefit of a common backbone infrastructure, which does not compete with them at the local access level. Under Cree leadership, the service providers also benefit from the EU Communication Network's regional purchasing strength, acquiring lower rates for internet transit and other services through EU communication networks agreements with southern carriers. Unlike in the Northwest Hell case, there is little threat of holdups. Core critical assets remain public property. Services can be based on cost recovery and social policy objectives versus profit motives and difficult to enforce regulatory decisions. Now, public ownership does not preclude private sector participation and the development of markets in managing core network bills and operations. The Cree have had a great working relationship with their vendor of choice, Alcatel-Lucent. 
Alcatel Lucent managed detailed engineering construction and maintenance and provided network operations su center support while ECN staff prepared to take over network operations. In addition, at the local access level, there is a growing market for local uh, internet service providers. So in conclusion, I want you to think about these contrasting approaches to developing open access networks in northern Canada. The regulator wants to improve transport in northern networks, but the regulatory system is structurally flawed. Regulatory reviews are adversarial. Decision maker access to critical information is asymmetric and potentially biased by self-interested parties. Regulators are in Ottawa and don't have a clear sense of what's going on in northern regions. By contrast, a regional publicly led open access network depends on cooperation. Publicly owned infrastructure reduces the risk of holdups without necessarily stifling private sector participation. EU communications network stakeholders have a clearer sense of the state of their joint investments. Their collective can take advantage of its combined strengths to negotiate lower rates with southern carriers and content providers. So the near to distant futures should present important opportunities and challenges for next generation broadband networks in the north. We know from the latest studies that the costs of upgrading and, and diversifying northern transport networks to support real broadband could cost hundreds of millions and potentially billions of dollars. We know that to sustainably finance these networks will require the joint contributions of governments, industries and communities, in addition to the strategic investments made by telecom incumbents and their competitors, with possible subsidies flowing through the regulatory system. Given the high costs they face, it should be in the mutual interest of these parties to cooperate and combine their resources. As the EU Communications Network is demonstrating, when properly enforced, open access principles provide ways to protect and nurture this mutual interest. Thanks for your time. The mic, oh, there we go, thank you. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Mrs. Juana Spinu. She's the Executive Director for Nunavut Broadband Development Corporation. Prior to joining NBDC in the fall of 2009, she worked with the Nunavut's Department of Economic Development and Transportation as Senior Advisor in Innovation and Technology. Mrs. Spinu also spent over a decade leveraging ICT in the not-for-profit and arts sectors, working with the Iglulik Izuma Productions and our night video productions on numerous interactive media projects, film and video, video productions, researching and developing streaming and telepresence tools for CA Net4 and similar large bandwidth networks at Montreal Société des Arts Technologiques as the first technical director of Montreal Studio XX, a feminist digital arts center, as the new media associate at the BAM Center for the Arts, and as the production department coordinator at CKUT-FM, Montreal's premier community radio station. She has been involved in promoting free and open source software, media literacy, and community radio in Canada and abroad. And uh, there will be a co-presenter, Mr. Daniel Rubenstein, who is Senior Policy Advisor for the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Daniel leads FSM's policy and research on telecommunications, rail safety, and rural and northern communities, and supports several committees of FCM's National Board of Directors including the Northern and Remote Forum, Rural Forum, and Standing Committee on Infrastructure and Transportation Policy. Daniel represented the municipal sector at the House of Commons Standing Committee on Industry, Science and Technology during its recent study of broadband and internet access in Canada, and has provided comments to the CRTC and Industry Canada on a variety, variety of telecommunications issues, including the review of Northwest Style's regulatory framework and modernization plan. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you. So Daniel and I will be talking about the digital divide and the impact on northerners. And um, as Jean-Francois already alluded, there are many technical solutions. And our position is that 
this isn't a technical challenge. Better telecommunications in the north is not a technical challenge, it's a public policy challenge. So I want to start by putting the digital divide in context. Um, broadband access correlates closely with socioeconomic inequity, and the growing digital divide perpetuates inequities between rich and poor, between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities, as well as between urban, urban and rural and remote communities. The table on the right of the slide is data from uh, Adam's uh, report from last year for the conference board that looked at the average cost of telecommunication services across the north. And essentially what you see is that Nunavut, for example, has the highest cost and lowest service levels in the north overall and in Canada in general. Um, so what does that mean for users? Well. According to the 2013 um, Communications Monitoring Report from the CRTC, the average Canadian downloads 28.4 gigs and uploads 5.4 gigs a month. If anyone in Nunavut tried to be an average Canadian in most communities, you'd be paying about $450 for bandwidth per month. In the three communities that have DSL service, you're still looking at about $240 for bandwidth. Consequently, the average Nunavut user um, goes through 9 to 12 gigs a month, depending on the community and your service provider. Now, the uh, graph on the right has some interesting information from Kinnick, uh, the average Kinnick monthly usage per user in gigabits, gigabytes, sorry, um, over the last four years. And what you see is that for three of those four years, that usage hovered around three gigs a month, which not coincidentally was the cap in the previous plan. And as soon as the Broadband Canada funding kicked in and the new cap of 10 gigs kicked in, you see steady increase in monthly um, throughput. So what this shows us is that there's pent up need and essentially price and data caps dictate user patterns. There's a strong link between household income and internet access, and the biggest impact is on youth. I'll start a bit with uh, Canadian statistics, since there's not a lot of detailed data for Nunavut, um, but then I will talk about the Nunavut implications. So in Canada, there's a huge impact on household internet access, depending on household income. And in the top 25% income bracket, the household internet use is at 94.5%. There's a 30% difference between that top 25% income bracket and the bottom 25% income bracket, where you only see 62.5% of those households using the internet. Um, public internet access sites, such as libraries, are a huge resource for people in low-income households that can't afford or don't have internet access at home, and especially for youth. So whereas the Canadian average for using public internet sites, access sites is 9.7%. That number goes to 26.8% for youth in that bottom 25% income bracket. So public access internet sites are an important resource for youth in low income households. So what about none of it? Well, we know from the 2009-2010 housing needs survey that about 59% of Nunavut households have internet access. Now that number has gone up since the study was conducted several years ago. We also know from that study that there's a huge gap between communities. So some place like Echaluit has 76% household penetration rate. Other smaller communities can be as low as the mid-30s, mid-40% household penetration rate. Nunavut has the youngest population in all of Canada. The median age is 24.8, the median age in Canada is 40, I believe, or thereabout. What people might not know is that the current government funding that supports improved connectivity for none of its schools, now this is use for students and teachers, not for administrative use, that funding ends at the end of this school year. The Canmore funding that kind of extended the cancelled CAP funding for public access sites in Nunavut ends at the end of this fiscal year. And last but not least, the Broadband Canada funding that supports affordable broadband access across the territory ends in 2016. 
So how did we get here? Well, Canada is the only G8 country without a national broadband plan. Broadband is not part of the basic service objective, but basic voice is. And as our co-presenters have already alluded to, to date, broadband in the North has been supported through a series of targeted government investments, such as BRAND, Broadband for Rural and Northern Development, NSI, National Satellite Initiative, and most recently, Broadband Canada. The uh, graph on the left is very, very densely packed with information, so I'd like to take a little bit of time to go through it. It talks, it shows the uh, federal investments in broadband from 2003, sorry, for telecommunications, from 2003 and projected until 2016. It's about $400 million over that period of time. It's broken down by year, and additionally, it's broken down by uh, recipient, if you will. So the yellow for each year, that kind of steady and increasing investment, that's CRTC voice, that's to deliver basic phone service and high cost service areas in the north. The blue is government broadband. It's not as steady, but it's very, very generous in a few years. And that little red stripe across the top on most years, that is residential broadband investment in the north. Oops, sorry. So then of course the next question is, well, what would it cost? And there's different costs depending on the technology, depending on the service area, depending on the service levels and other assumptions. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all the various figures, but essentially the point I want to make is that it's going to cost a lot more than what's been invested to date. But I'd actually like to look at the question of cost from the other side. What would it cost to maintain the digital divide? What would it cost to do nothing? In 2011-2012, NBDC commissioned a broadband socioeconomic impact assessment, and the study looked at what the current impact of high-speed internet access is and what the estimated impact of improved connectivity would be. And so from that study, we can see possible financial impacts. 23 to 30 million dollars annually in lost GDP, lost household income, and lost tax revenue. In terms of employment, you're talking about 155 to 201 jobs. The um, more qualitative um, impacts are things like lower quality of life for northern residents, as well as challenges in the delivery of education, health, and other critical government services, which uh, hobble along with uh, less than adequate bandwidth. Uh, the study that Adam worked on also looked at the socioeconomic impact of improved connectivity. And they had different assumptions, different model, different numbers. And the point that I want to make is that there is a cost to Northerners and to Canada in maintaining the digital divide, and it's a very significant cost. So now I'll hand it off to Daniel. Thanks. Thanks very much. You can you can hold your applause for a second. Where I'm just going to jump in here for a couple of slides, and then I'm just going to come back to just um, close up. You may be wondering why FCM is involved in in this conversation. We're the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. We represent local governments and councils across the country, and we have a northern remote forum that typically deals with core infrastructure, hard infrastructure like water and wastewater roads, regional infrastructure, um, but digital infrastructure and connectivity uh, is at the top of the list as well and, and uh, uh, from a public policy point of view, not a technical point of view, this is an issue that the federal government and the country uh, have to put on a, a sustainable foot and that's sort of the message I want to deliver here very quickly. So, you know, we've talked about lost opportunities, it's been alluded to, the range between health, education, uh, I'd add small businesses as well. Uh, depend on having connectivity to access a bigger market and uh, um, we have emergency response capabilities, we have economic development, there's a, a huge focus right now in this country on tapping our economic resources. We know we can't do that without connectivity and, uh, and so in that way, just to reinforce this, it's both lost opportunities in the future but also the threat to lose where we are today if we don't have a sustainable 
um, funding plan uh, going down the road. That means disincentives to invest, uh, this means lower health outcomes, a lack of education access, all that kind of thing. And I, I just want to put it in context of the service parity issues that uh, I want to talk about within Nunavut, but if you look across the territories, and I mean at FCM we're looking at the territories and the provincial north, um, but speaking about the territories, you know, you go from the Yukon that is able to deliver some distance education, um, digital x-ray sharing over health, and you go to NWT that has some of this, but it depends where your community are, and then in Nunavut, obviously, everyone's on the same page in terms of satellite access, but you're not able to tap into um, innovative services. So um, not having a, a service parity across the north uh, uh, is, is a major issue that we need to confront. And I, I also, I was rereading the ACA report to, before coming here today, and uh, uh, one thing kind of stood out at me that, you know, we've been talking about ad hoc programs. It's not just funding programs to support, you know, NIS. It's also individual federal departments have taken initiatives on their own to support their own work that has no spillover in the community. So there was the example of the uh, NRCAN uh, Polar Continental Shelf researchers in Resolute who are depending on their own custom satellite connection that's totally separate from their local kinet connection. And, uh, you know, I think that's an example of we know that investments happen, it's just are we doing it in a comprehensive way and all coming uh, to the, the table together? So it, from a policy perspective, what are we looking at from FCM and MBTC shares this? We totally support the idea of having a comprehensive review of the basic service objective that the CRTC has in place, enhancing that to include broadband. And related to that is making sure that the National Contribution Fund, which currently only funds the local uh, provider, the, the ILEC, sorry, um, be expanded in a technologically neutral um, way uh, open to any provider that the consumer wants to uh, choose. Uh, that's a position that FCM has expressed before. Um, and certainly we feel that this is a, a way to have a, a long-term comprehensive approach that evolves with needs. So rather than benchmarking a program to what becomes a political calculation on need, we, we find a way to have this evolve over time. Um, and I, I just wanted to say, you know, uh, I'm going to pass it back to Iwana just to finish up, but uh, FCM's raison d'etre for many, many years has been to advocate for long-term infrastructure for hard infrastructure, like roads and bridges, and if you've ever heard about our organization, the media is probably about those issues. Well, we need to apply the same um, uh, approach to public policy on, on communications, and uh, certainly with the expired programs coming up, uh, I certainly encourage everyone here to to really think hard about how an extended BC BSO would fit into that and achieve that objective. So I'll just pass it back to Juana. Thanks very much. Thanks. Um, I just want to talk really quickly about the CRTC. Um, Adam also talked a bit about their recent decision. And it, to me, it's good news. In 2011, when they reviewed the BSO, their position was the CRTC is not getting involved in broadband, we're going to leave it to the private sector and targeted government investments. And in the decision released in Jan and, um, December, they basically recognized that without their intervention, the digital divide in the North will likely continue. So I'm looking forward to the many proceedings they plan to hold this year. And just to summarize, what we'd like to see is broadband recognized an as an essential service under the BSO with long-term, stable, and scalable funding, a reasonable minimum service level for all Canadians, regardless of location or the backbone or backhaul technology. And I, I don't think we've talked about it a bit, but there's this kind of false um, character distinction between, say, the territorial north in places like Nunavik or Nunatsiavut, where there's quite a lot of similarities with Nunavut, but they're kind of seen as separate from how Nunavut, NWT, and the Yukon um, are regulated in certain aspects. And finally, um, we'd like to see that subsidy be portable so that it encourages competition and innovation and supports consumer choice. Thank you. about any of the stats. That's...
All right, thank you, Juana and, uh, and Daniel. Um, so this concludes our uh, presentations. Uh, so we'd like to open up the floor for some questions. Um, uh, if you do, please uh, introduce yourself and um, feel free to address the question to the panel or to a specific uh, panelist. Thanks for spending your Saturday morning with us. <laughs> Hi, Roland Renner with Hunter Communications. Um, Adam Pfizer's presentation, you talked about open access networks, which has some implications for ownership, uh, even raises the question of public ownership or national ownership, as well as the example that you gave of community ownership in conjunction, in that case, with Hydro Quebec. Uh, can you comment a little bit more about options for ownership and how that would interconnect with all of the existing providers? Sir? 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 Thank you very much for your question. Um, I guess there are a number of different options. Um, I'm not sure if anyone caught this morning's news story about Mackenzie Valley FiberLink and three companies that are bidding to uh, potentially roll out that network, uh, network built for, on behalf of the government of the Northwest Territories. Um, I'm not quite sure what the ownership model will become as that project proceeds, but my understanding that it, is it will likely include a substantial ownership stake on the part of the government of the Northwest Territories in relationship probably in some sort of public-private partnership with a network uh, developer who would then probably likely become a network operator through some sort of concession agreement. Um, perhaps the prototype for these types of networks is um, what was created with Alberta Supernet in around 2005, 2006. Now that's a really interesting model that continues to evolve, but what it initially represented was the government of Alberta deciding to roll out um, an extensive fiber backbone network to its rural communities, about 420 of them, under the auspices that it would co-invest with Bell Canada and a company called Axia uh, Net Media. Bell Canada would own a substantial metro core that it would invest in, and in invested considerable amounts of money, and then an extended fiber core, uh, sort of fiber network built around the core into the rural communities would be owned by the government of Alberta just because of the significant uh, costs involved and, and the diminished revenues that you would get from that sort of environment. Um, Axia Net Media was a participant in the build and became the network operator, uh, particularly on the rural side of things, and has subsequently also continued to invest in its own network in this environment. So it, the model that has sort of emerged, and all of this also is taking place within a kind of um, quasi-regulatory framework, mainly enforced by contract under Service Alberta, which was a ministry created to kind of manage the supernet. But what has evolved is an interesting blend of public ownership to secure you know, those areas where the private sector is likely not going to invest, um, a core agreements with the private sector where things seem to be a bit more uh, liquid, I would say, in terms of supporting network, ongoing network investments. And then this sort of shifting landscape at a local community level where there are over 70, probably even more, independent um, internet service providers operating in this space, sometimes working with uh, local regional municipalities operating on their own. So it's a really rich, interesting sort of environment that was created around this initial um, public investment on the rural side and a sort of investment by its um, corporate partners, Bell Canada and Axia Net Media, to sort of make things work in terms of connecting with southern carriers. So that's a really interesting model um, at a much grander scale, perhaps the grandest in Canada. But then we see things like with EU Ishi, which is a specific regional model. Um, and then maybe Jean-Francois, I don't know if you want to comment on you know, the National Satellite Initiative and whether that was some kind of an open access arrangement. I'm not 
entirely sure, but there might be something there. Um, okay, yeah, my, I think my microphone is working. Um, so in, in the model that KRG has taken, we are actually not, Tamani Internet is not a uh, separate legal entity, it's actually part of the Kadavik Regional Government. So, so in, in essence, um, the, it's a public ownership of a network, but if you look at who owns the actual network assets, the, the, the <coughs> core of the network, some of it is owned by Telesat, some of it is owned by uh, Bell in the Knet uh, area, some of it is owned by KRG itself, some of it is owned by Knet, so there's a, it's a really big mix of, of both public and uh, private ownership. Networks being what they are, um, you know, you can own a certain layer of the network and not own the physical layer that's underneath, so there's certainly no um, there's no constraints in, in terms of building a public network that has private sector involvement, and and um, and there is uh, there there is opportunity there for private sector to be involved and to to uh, have economic activity. So that's certainly in line with with the way we see it. the issue being that without government involvement in areas where there is essentially market failure to provide local services, somebody has to step up in, in, in the public sector. In our case, we offer sort of a hybrid model between what's going on with the EU and a pure um, sort of public, I, uh, public ISP that would be sort of a regulated monopoly where we provide not, we have a backbone infrastructure, but we also provide service to service providers in those communities that are big enough and that have enough capa human capacity to deliver the service, like, like for example in Kujuak, but we have to provide service, retail service, in the smaller communities where there just isn't any organization that's able to go right into the home. Um, so, so it's sort of a hybrid model and it was basically built based on the need as opposed to any particular uh, um, theoretical model. Uh, are there any more questions? This is the tamest audience we've ever had at a communications uh, session. I, I do have a question. Uh, John Fawcett, <clears throat> in your presentation you mentioned about uh, the economic impact analysis. And this is a very expensive proposition. I, total agreement, I feel very passionately that um, this is much needed. Um, I've been living in the North for a long time now, much, much needed, but it's a lot of money. And money usually follows business cases in our world anyway. Just wondering in that business case analysis, how you came up with those, with those numbers through the years? What, what kind of information was gathered and, and just the process to build that business case? So, um, it's an interesting question. I see Stuart Jack in the audience, who is uh, the, uh, our economist from Nordicity. So, if, if you want to get very specific details, you, you can probably uh, ask him afterwards. Uh, but to give you a summary, uh, it's, it's an economic model that was built on available statistics and the OECD model for what happens to an economy when you increase bandwidth. So there are some economists that have published studies on uh, looking at models uh, of, uh, of economies and impact on economy, um, the impact of broadband on economy. So when you add so many megabits, you get so much return on uh, in terms of economic activity. And that economic activity is in terms of job creation, in terms of, of uh, uh, business opportunities that weren't there before, potentially in terms of, uh, of cost savings for, uh, for government activities and so on and so forth. So we, for that analysis and, and, and what you saw in that graph, like I said, the, the points are actually what was determined and the line is, is an extrapolation on those points. So that's not, the, the line is not a hard science uh, determination by any means. Um, but it was based on the available statistics and the accepted a model sort of in the academic uh, circle of, of economics. Can I just add something to that? So in NBDC's study, we looked at the impact on Nunavut and the impact on Canada as well. 
And I think that's uh, an interesting approach because when you see an economic impact in Nunavut, it has implications for the rest of Canada. People have better connectivity, they're buying goods, they're buying services, they're doing stuff in the north, and that money also goes south. It creates jobs down south, it creates uh, you know, revenue for businesses down south. So when you look at the huge uh, upfront cost of improving telecommunications infrastructure, and then you see over the years the socioeconomic rewards, it's not just for Nunavut or Nunavik or whatever region is getting better telecommunication services, but it's for the entire country. And you know, one of the projects NBDC wants to do next year is to look at historically kind of these nation building investments. What did the railroads cost Canada? What the Trans Canada Highway cost Canada? What would the information highway cost Canada? And what would the benefits of it be? Good morning, I'm Stuart Jack with Nordicity. Um, so in the model we did for Katowice, uh, we looked at direct economic impact, so we looked at jobs, GDP, employment, um, or salary, excuse me. Uh, we looked at it for the region though, so KRG region. What we weren't able to do, and hopefully we'll do the next round, we'll be looking at the impacts for the province of Quebec and the national government. And just one example to, uh, to uh, further was um, comment is the mines in KRG don't really contribute an awful lot to the local KRG economy. They do contribute an awful lot to the Quebec economy and the Canadian economy. The tax revenues, the royalties actually go to the provincial government for the most part, but also to the Canadian government. So when you take the the all-in approach, you really have to widen the pond and look at and measure those impacts, those direct economic impacts in the big, bigger uh, jurisdictions where the money might come from to actually invest in a new network. Okay, well, if there aren't any more questions, what I'm going to do is, uh, not that I'm Peter Mansbridge, but what he usually does is he gives the panelists one final little say, like a final thought. And we've heard a lot of things here today. Um, I, I'd like to know in maybe 30 seconds. Oh, sorry. There is one more question. Actually, this is, I am not from, I'm a private investor uh, from the private equity field. My name is James Bursey. From the point of view of an investor, the Canadian North starts basically 100 miles from the U.S. border. And that is because of infrastructure issues that you were talking here. It seems to me that from the comments that I've heard, and I'm no telecommunication expert, but I am a business businessman, that we have a lot of different silos all trying to do the same thing. Now, I know Adam, you and I are thinking the same way. It seems to me that you have exactly the same problem in Northern Canada as the United States has in its healthcare. That is the mantra of the private sector saying that we can be more efficient in the public sector. That's not true. And hence, it would seem to me that we have to find some courage, and especially it seems in the Eastern Arctic, to coalesce the silos that require the services, many of you are up there on the podium, and find both government, central government financing, as well as private sector. That kind of model is being done extremely well in northern Scandinavia. And I would suggest that if you continue to operate in separate silos as you're doing now, many of us with more gray hair will be talking about the same subject 10 years from now. Because I've noticed the studies, and you do great studies, and we always come to the same conclusion. Small population, large territory, high cost of investment, and nobody's getting service. So my challenge is, who is going to take the lead especially since it appears the Eastern Arctic, and I use that generally, remember, 100 miles from the, from the U.S. borders where the Arctic starts from my point of view. Who's going to take that lead? Okay, great insight and sure. that's really good closing comments. Yeah, I, and, and this, is, this is an issue that we, that we have identified and, and in fact, uh, while there is no um, 
there is no single organization right now that appears to be taking the lead across all of the, um, the territories for, because of the confederation issues and because of jurisdiction issues, as, you know, certain federal ministries can't operate in Quebec and so on and so forth. Uh, however, at a local level, all of the organizations communicate, collaborate, and sometimes form partnerships. The, an example uh, in our case is a partnership that the Inuit of Northern Quebec formed with the First Nations of Northwestern Ontario and Northern Manitoba. So we, we actually jointly operate the network and we also have, uh, in some cases, uh, participated in federal programs jointly as three separate nations, three separate cultures uh, across three separate provinces in one program to, um, to meet the needs of our community. So there certainly is a willingness to partner with uh, other regions and we uh, are actually in, in very close communication and we do collaborate with each other. Uh, there is a lack, however, in terms of a common front organization to carry that message with enough weight to affect uh, policy change or so it seems. Although I would say things seem to be shifting based on what we've seen in the last uh, few months based on the, the CRTC decision. Thank you. Any further comments on there before we get our last question from the audience? I just think it would be interesting to consider how might we have to reorganize at the federal level to support and nurture these types of regional initiatives? Because it seems like there is an expectation that the federal government will be playing a substantial role in investing and improving telecommunications in the Eastern Arctic, either them or is it going to be then some sort of uh, partnership between the provinces that are implicated? I'm not sure, but there used to be something called the Department of Communications at the federal level. Um, maybe it's time to revisit that, I don't know. I'm sure some of you have heard that before too. I have a brief remark uh, concerning your communication. I'm from the government of Greenland and uh, we have uh, ch similar challenges as you have uh, sketched in your uh, presentation. Greenland is a large country with 74 different settlements across mostly on the west coast of Greenland. We don't have one solution for our telecommunication. We have uh, invested uh, over 160 million Canadian dollars uh, for fiber optic uh, uh, cable uh, in the past five years and we are planning to extend this cable with uh, additional 80 million dollars investment uh, for the next uh, couple of years. Uh, but uh, we can cover Greenland, the entire Greenland with one solution. We will always have uh, small communities uh, without the same um, broadband solution uh, where we have to rely on the satellite uh, solution for many small communities. Nevertheless, the government is planning to look at the ownership regimes in our uh, public-owned uh, telecommunications company next month uh, to see whether um, if there is an option to invite private capital in order to get their private public partnership regime in the future for not only communication but in transportation and logistics and so forth. Uh, so we face uh, some similar discussions of uh, when uh, the private sector and the private uh, capital uh, should uh, be intervened uh, in communications. We, do, we don't have a solution for all settlements, but at least uh, we are looking at uh, uh, the broad majority of the public uh, or the population uh, in Greenland and see if we can provide uh, some more liberal approach to the access uh, for capital in order to get uh, a more liberal uh, communications uh, system as, as we have. But, uh, it would be interesting to get some some uh, discussions uh, uh, in the Baffin region to see how we can make uh, uh, cheaper solutions, but 
also on where and how we can cooperate uh, between governments, but, uh, but with uh, private capital as well. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Sadly, that brings us to the end of our time today. Uh, big thank you to you for waking up early and coming and joining us, joining us for this session this morning. And a big thank you again to our panel. And I'm going to let uh, Moana have some, some uh, closing remarks. Sorry, I just want to make a really quick comment. I mean, I think that uh, at least for, for NBDC, none of it is, uh, uh, Greenland is a very uh, inspiring case. I mean, they have uh, cell service to communities that have over 70 occupants. And most none of the communities don't have cell service. And that's not a technology decision. It's a public policy decision. Um, on the question of sort of public-private ownership, I think one other player really needs to be part of that discussion, and that's the Inuit organizations, um, because I think that there is a role to play for um, the Inuit organizations in governance and ownership of telecommunications infrastructure, at least in predominantly Inuit areas, so that there's you know control over the decisions that are made and the benefits, the revenue also stay within the territory. Once again, great insight. Um, thank you again to our panel this morning, and thank you for being here. And hopefully in 10 years at Northern Lights 2024, when we have some more gray hair, that we're not telling the same story. And I'm confident that we won't be. Thanks again.